Yoni, your presentation was perfect lead on to what I'm going to talk about. It's about now taking it on in terms of the practical side, in terms of how we deal with regolith and, and forward on from there. Uh, there's a couple of key points which I want to make. One is that the regolith factor is real, we can't ignore it. The next one then is that a geochemical anomaly is a function of the bedrock geochemistry plus or minus the regolith, plus or minus the landscape, which, leads, which was all about dispersion. Next one then is explorers. We always need to complete a regolith terrain assessment. That could be a map or at least assess what the regolith is like. You need to look at your projects in 3D, but think in 4D, exactly as Fiona said in terms of thinking about the anomalies are off to one side, that last picture from Joyce's paper 84. You know, the anomalies down there in the valley, you pick up that anomaly, but where did it come from? You've seen that in 3D, think in 4D, how are the elements moved? Next one then is you need to log. Fiona made the point about you've got to record what you, what you guys are doing. We put a lot of faith in the chemistry. We need to make sure that we know those guys have actually gone there and collected those samples we've sent them out to get. And there, have been, there was a data set I looked at only last week. I don't believe the guys went there and collected the samples. When I looked at it, it looked like horrible batch effects. And I was hoping to show that today, but I didn't get permission to be able to show it. Um, but you just look at it and you go, there's one section where they'd logged everything and everything was fitting perfectly, and another section where the chemistry just didn't match the terrain, didn't match the geology. There were no field logs for it. It was collected during a civil war in that country. I, don't, I suspect it was collected under several trees and the whole lot was submitted and no one was going to go and check it. That's left big holes, that's left great opportunities. Unfortunately, the company I was doing the consulting for at the time wasn't able to win that property. Someone else has got great opportunities and it's because people believed in the data and it was garbage. The next one that I want to make is about doing fit for purpose geochemistry. It's about choosing the techniques. If you've got a large project, there's not one technique. Fiona put up that map that showed the, the deposit and about dispersion, whatever, that was just based off soil sampling. I'd say you don't do that. What you do is it's going to be stream sediments. It could be soils, it could be lags, it could be parts of the tenement where you cannot use any surface geochemistry because the cover's greater than 20 metres or something like that. Therefore, then you'd put that in the too hard basket for surface geochemistry. If you really want to test the property before you leave it, you then, you've then got to drill it or something like that. So if you've got a good geophysical signature or something, surface chemistry may not work. If it does work, it's going to be working at very low levels and you need to go for some other technique. Um, and failing to do any of these steps, you greatly increase the luck factor. There's five components to exploration as far as I'm concerned. First one's money. The next one is project generation. If it ain't there, you can't find it. The next one after that then is you need the right people, the right techniques, and then the little finger is luck, and we always want to reduce that one. So I'll go through this very quickly. So regolith, um, very simple definition, everything between fresh, fresh rock and fresh air, therefore means it's all your weathered rock and residual uh, materials, plus all the transported materials, alien sands, glacial deposits, lakes, etc. Um, standard regolith profile, um, there's two main components. You've got what's called the pedolith and the saprolith. In the pedolith, the weathering has been so intense, the textures and uh, fabrics have been destroyed. You won't recognize the rock type by looking at the fabrics necessarily, or um, as Fiona pointed out, there'll be changes in the chemistry. So that's happening in the top bit. That's where the chemistry is going to be most mobile and you'll get the biggest variations. Once you get down into the saprolith, it's isovolumetric weathering. You can recognize the te textures and fabrics, and you should be able to get some structural measurements off it. Um, important one to, re to recognize, this is a residual profile. Um, in a landscape, you could have a residual profile. You may have any part of this profile present. And then on top of that could be transported material. So you could have transported material on top of fresh rock. And it may only be a few meters of cover, but the elements are still locked up in the rock and they won't get up through the cover. Um, is one aspect of it. Um, as you come down, the only covered in terms of dispersion, just to point out that it makes a difference in terms of where you are in the world. But generally the upper part in the ferruginous profile, that's where you're going to get enrichment of elements. If you're in the Yilgarn, for instance, um, where you've had saline groundwaters and formed gold chloride complexes, then as you've had increasing aridity, the water table then sits at a certain level and you get change in EHPH and you'll then get super gene type formation. 
But in West Africa, for instance, that doesn't occur. You haven't got the saline groundwaters, you don't tend to get super gene deeper in the profile. So the regolith factor, as I think of it, it's going to affect a lot of, a lot of aspects of, of exploration. It has geochemical effects. It's going to affect your min, min, mineralogy. And also it's, it has an impact on geophysics as well. And all of these disciplines really are key components of mineral exploration. It therefore has a, a big impact on our business, and you can't ignore it. And there have been some quite significant deposits which have been discovered over the years that are out under, under cover. Um, a wake-up call, I was working in Kalgoorlie in the, in the mid to, to late 80s, and um, Canal Nobel was discovered only 18 kilometers north of Kalgoorlie, over 4 million ounces, single point saw anomaly, um, less than 300 ppb. And the reason why it was a relatively low level was because of that red-brown transported soil on top. <coughs> and then beneath that, then, you've got this uh, leached inferred leach saprolite, where, the, where essentially, as the water table dropped away, the gold has been stripped out of the, out of the saprolite. So a bit like the example that Fiona showed in terms of copper going, in this case, it's gold that's gone. Um, but also, as well, just, just to point out that the, you know, it's the sort of area that people walked over, camped over. Very close to Kalgoorlie, people have been around here for a long time. They might think that single point anomaly is transported. It's coming off the workings, which are ta from Kanana town site that's only a kilometre and a half away. It was persistence by uh, Delta Gold in particular um, that persisted out there and eventually got down beneath that pallid zone into, into the bedrock that led on to that discovery. So good, good work there. This one here in Tanzania, um, at Geyser, um, 108 pp. First up, I'll just say this area has been mined for a better part of um, at least at least 80 years. Um, when I first went there in the in the mid eight uh, mid 90s, Naimulali Hill at the distance there was was being explored by Anglo American. Through the hills here in the foreground, you had Lone Cone and others. There was a couple of million ounces there. Some sampling by Anglo, uh, by Ashanti before Anglo Gold brought them out led to soil sampling, 108 ppb anomaly, um, which sampled up at about this area. Um, coming off these Biff ridges, you got out through here, there's over 60 meters of cover. Very quickly passes out under cover. And I think of that, if Nine Kanga, which is over 6 million ounces, was just another 100 or 200 meters further away from the base of the Biffs it probably still wouldn't have been discovered. So very significant deposit, which was a game changer there into what's now an 18 million ounce district. Marilla in Mali, history, an area with, with a long history of uh, artisanal mining, going back a um, thousand years or more. Part of an AIDS survey that was done by uh, Bujiko, the Belgium Geological Survey, did this, did this um, soil sampling program, did some infill, um, Fairly low level, spotty anomaly in a district that normally you get grams or hundreds of PPBs of gold. No artisanal workings on it, did some close up. BHP came in then and diamond drilled it. Got some pretty spectacular results, I think, at 66, at 3.49. But it wasn't a big footprint to the anomaly. They ended up selling out to Rangold. Rangold came in and put a trench in. The first trench went 298 metres at 5.4 grams. The mine made a billion dollars free cash in four years and at about a $300 uh, gold price. This, again, it's the deposits are out under the regolith. What I'd say there, BHP did the wrong technique. They diamond drilled it. It was too focused. They should have come off. They should have used it back in regolith terrain context and looked at the right um, a fit for purpose technique. Um, out here, the eastern gold fields. Um, You've got a lot of variation in the terrain is what I'm trying to show here, I suppose. You've got areas where you've got outcrop on surface, you've got transported areas, you've got salt lakes. The interesting one through here is actually where you head out undercover, the bigger deposits are out, out through there, so Wallaby and Sunrise Dam. All the early discoveries at Laverton are all out in the erosional areas. It's where the chemistry works really well. You can pan the soils, you can loam, you can do stream sediments, you'll find it easily. It's with time that people persist and they find the bigger deposits. I'd say those bigger deposits are also next door to where the big structures are. And those big structures then, if you've got a lot of sulphides in there, they weather down and you end up with um, 
greater erosion taking place and then over time then the, the landscape's in filled. It's what I call a constipated terrain. It's just filled up with all the weathering stuff. All right. Oh, and just while we're on this one here, just point out, if you look at Google Earth, on the right, that's how I look if you look with your normal eyes. If you look on the right, this is where I've processed the Landsat and done a decorrelation stretch on it, bands four, five, and seven. Much more effective than just using natural color in terms of picking out the different material. So sampling the regolith doesn't always test the bedrock for mineralization. Regolith type can vary considerably over, over the bedrock unit, and the strength and size of geochemical anomalies is a function of bedrock mineralization, <laughs> regolith, and geomorph. And it's been responsible for hiding significant deposits. There's been a lot of research, um, particularly during the years of CRC Leem, particularly coming out of CSIRO. And Mel here and was heavily involved in that. I went onto the website yesterday. It's still live. It's still active. It's still there. Huge repository of information. Fortunately, st still available. Encourage people to delve back in there. Lots of downloads, etc. The next one I want to talk about is the regular terrain assessments and producing maps. You don't necessarily have to produce a map, but when you map, you're forced to understand the imagery. It forces you. You, you can't draw the lines. You always run the risk of someone driving out there and checking your map. So you tend to understand it that little bit better. All right? There's lots of remote sensing. Um, I always do it before I plan a geochem survey. Um, you do some sort of assessment. won't always map, but at least do it. There's lots of free data out there, courtesy of the US taxpayer. Luckily, Donald Trump hasn't found out about that yet. Um, but otherwise, Google Earth and Bing Maps and Arc, Arc Base Map, all right? Uh, I've said about always making sure you understand the imagery. The minimum data set I'd use would be an elevation model. It's about understanding the landform. That's the absolute basic. And regolith information will come from spectrally, spectrally enhanced regolith uh, satellite imagery. So I use that a great deal. The SRTM's been around, which was the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, um, since about 2003. Fantastic data set. I have all 90, uh, 90 meter resolution for the whole world, just sits on my laptop. So wherever I'm working, I can use it. It was flown on the Space Shuttle in, in 2000, in nine days. It covered most of the globe at uh, 30 meters re resolution. It was then published at 90 meter and steadily now it's been released at the, back to the native 30 meter. And you can then have a picture at least of the terrain. You can, I can generate drainage channels from it, I can do contours, and I can put the whole lot together, all really useful for catchment analysis, et cetera, when I'm planning stream sediments programs. Also, I do surface analysis on it um, routinely. Here's some pictures on the left. Is You just look at the grayscale image on the left. This is from central Australia out in the Tanami pretty hard to understand just by doing some simple surface topography on it and just look at the scale down there you can see that some of those flat areas those are old valleys they're several kilometers wide you won't pick that if you're looking at air photographs or whatever and I suspect that relates to something like that it's the old glaciations that hit Australia during the Sturtian and also during the Permian those are clear cover areas it's good to know where the cover is those go in the too hard basket. And just simple surface analysis will help pick that out. You've also got the ridges where it's likely to be residual and then where the dispersion is taking place away from that. And there's been a lot of elevation models just to show you here. So the difference between um, 90 meter versus 30 meter versus you know, the one meter type done from satellite 770 kilometers up, you'll get 50, 50, cent, 50 centimeter pixels, vertical accuracy of about 20 centimeters. It's, it's as good as LIDAR. All these days you can get the Terrasar data. Just point out the difference, so you've got something called a DSM or a DTM. Most of these radar ones are DSMs, so it's a digital surface model, which means it's the top of whatever it's hit. It could be a building, a tree or whatever, as opposed to a DTM that's your base one. So just be careful if you're putting your drill holes against SRTM and things, or some of these other elevation models, you may be snapping your collars to tops of trees not the ground surface. But generally for us, it works fine. I also use them. I think a good regolith map is one where you can visualize the terrain. You know what, what it's like. I look at this map. This is published, published map from the Tanami, uh, John Wilford's map and others out of, out of GA in Canberra. And I actually struggle to understand it. So what I do whenever I get a map like this, 
just get the SRTM and do a grey shade on it, and now I can, I can see it. I can visualise the units. You can also then extend out. I can also use it then to validate it. So all the regolith maps here in Australia, WA from the GSWA and others, you, I just put an elevation model behind. It then talks to me. I can understand it. I can then start to plan the chemistry. Another one to use, this is where I've actually done a regolith map. This is in the Kalgoorlie region. Um, uh, covers about 6,000 square k's, produced from air photos in the early 90s when I did this one. Looks like this. I uh, put an elevation model behind it. Blue units are hills, outcrops, simple breakdown like that. It's where I'd be using soil geochemistry without a problem. Greens are colluviums, yellows are alluviums. You can see that, you can understand that. A process the elevation so that it's got like a one meter ripple. It's just uh, elevation data from DOLA, Department of Land Administration, then processed it so it actually shows you the equivalent of one metre contours behind it. But as I said, the other one is uh, you need to have geology in there as well. So I merged geology, so I take the geology boundaries with landform and regolith, and I got landform regolith geology map. And then some of the ones then that start coming through, the red zones are pits, mines. One of them was actually, I did some drilling. I worked with Stephen Turley here over 30 years ago, and the driller that I was doing a drill program on here, he then came up and worked on the same project as Stephen and I did 33 years ago up near Mekathara, and uh, the same guy popped up at that other one, and we ended up finding the blue funnel mine down there. But what I show here is where those red circles are, those are areas where you've got that same stratigraphy that's passing out under cover. Surface geochemistry is not going to work there. I suspect there's gaps in, in the knowledge, but you're able to start playing. Exploration is a big jigsaw puzzle. You need to know where to lock in pieces which are real and where pieces are, uh, where to believe the data and where not to believe it. Where to expect a strong response and where to expect a weak response. This allows you to do that. Link, geology, landform, regolith. They're all important. In the old days, I used to use uh, photographs a lot. Um, this was my setup in my office in West Perth in, in, um, over 10 years ago. And had, had the stereoscope, looking at things in 3D so I could get the dispersion, get everything right. Um, and it worked well. These days, nerdy glasses, th true color 3D monitor. Everything stands up in glorious 3D color. You can then put the threshold of geochemistry on. I'm looking at that. I can zoom in, I can zoom out. I can turn on the geology. I can turn on my field observation points and look at it all like that. It's all available through software that's, that people can buy and then do all the drawing on, on screen. Very powerful. With the global SRTM, I can look at anywhere in the world in 3D. So it works well. The other one is using satellite imagery. You know, our eyes are restricted. We just look in the visible spectrum about 400, 700 nanometers. You start taking things out in the short wave infrared, then different minerals and uh, materials on the surface reflect light from the sun in different ways, depending on how they are. We use the satellite imagery to process, by processing the satellite, taking the different bands, we can um, change the way that we look at the Earth. You look at it with different eyes, which then get, be able to give me, that gives me the ability then to be able to put on the the regolith component. And um, these days, instead of using Landsat, I actually use Sentinel imagery because it's 10 meter and 20 meter resolution. This one courtesy of the European taxpayer. Um, but natural color in 10 meter resolution or infrared. Infrared's fantastic um, for regolith because it's pulling out the vegetation. And the green is always iron oxides, which helps them with planning my surveys. Or I can do a regolith ratio or decorrelation. So they work well. Radiometrics, I use that a lot. But radiometrics like that, pretty hard to understand. First thing I do is put an elevation model behind it. Suddenly then it becomes a lot clearer. Um, remembering as well that if it's high in thorium, then it usually tends to be a residual profile, residual regolith, because the potassium gets leached very quickly in the weathering profile. Um, if I bring all this together now with an aerial photo interp, so this is just... <laughs> Back in the days when I had the stereoscope and the air photos, I've done the air photo in turf and then I've scanned it in, ortho rectified it, put that over the top. This now is giving me my landform regolith control. And with this then I can, um, I wish there was a cursor here, but essentially I would know now that there's a drainage channel coming off. This is all 
small outcropping. So through here to explore, I'd be taking a stream sediment out of here and out of here, which then would cover each, each of those would cover one particular area. But I wouldn't take a stream sediment from that top one, because out through here, you'd be dealing with soil cover. The drainage is not dissecting into the rocks, therefore it's not going to be effective. So through here, I'd need to be doing soils, lags, or maybe even augering and getting beneath the soil cover. So I need to change the technique as the landscape's changed. And by using the radiometrics, it's very clear. If I'm in tropical rainforest, this is the best data set to use for mapping regular. And the one I use. Geophysics can be useful. And I mentioned before that it's affected by, by the regular. Here it's been processed to give you high frequency. Over the top of the, the, the magnetics, it's showing um, um, plotting depth of cover. Uh, where the noise and the speckle is, that's due to the piezoliths and the iron oxides which have been stripped out and they're out in the, out in the colluvium. So it comes through pretty effectively and from this then it helps to produce maps that show depth of cover. I'll come on to one of those shortly. Alternatively in eastern gold fields you get like these rims around and you get the paleo channels which show up. So all regolith effects in geophysical data sets. Something like that. And then by doing this, you can look at the present day surface. This is Laverton District again. Or there I've gone through and taken information from about 80,000 drill holes. And then actually gone through and plotted out depth of cover to generate something that I'm calling a pseudo-paleotopography map. I did this in 2003, I think it was, roughly. Um, but yeah, look at the current day surface against the old one. And that's the thing. Look in 3D, think in 4D. So how things have evolved over time, and that's through this district here where I've spun it around. So you can see the channel, so out under here, past Windara and whatever it's showing there on the depth of cover is over 70 metres, 80 metres, and then running down past uh, Sunrise Dam, well over 90 metres, up to 140 metres of cover through there. So it's stripping back the terrain, and therefore which, which techniques to use where. So use the satellite imagery and digital elevation models. Um, there's lots of, you know, the higher the resolution, the, the sharper the interpretations, the better, the better results. And the overall aim really is to use these remote sensing products to enable, enable us to know what the regular terrain is like. Therefore, we can, plan, we can plan and interpret the geochemistry, surface geochemistry. It helps with our field navigation. We can generate good base maps. And we can also do th thoughtful planning. We're out in Africa and places, we know where the villages are, we know whether we're going to be impacting anyone in terms of their crops or whatever. So use, use those a lot. I do something which I call the FRED scheme, not the RED scheme. I don't like CSIRO's RED scheme, never have. Uh, I have the FRED scheme, which is the Ferruginous Residual Erosional Depositional Regime, which I present at AIG meeting in 99, and other companies now, glad to say, adapt. Next one now is looking in 3D, think in 4D, um, with the four, fourth dimension being time. Landscape evolution models for me are always a precursor to geochemical dispersion models. Um, as Fiona mentioned, you know, the elements are moving by various me mechanisms. It could be hydrodynamically, physical dispersion, or the effects of, of vegetation. And you've got remnants of old, old climates present you know, eastern gold fields close to us here. You've got glacial deposits out there. There's eskers down near Wujimutha. So the, the rivers which were underneath the glaciers are out there, still there in the landscape today. Or the fluvial glacial deposits that you get around Lancefield, just north of Laverton. They're still there on the surface. You can find these well-rounded bundis on, on the surface, fluvial glacial outwash. You have marine sediments with speculite beds. I, I found them up over 340 metres above present-day surface to the east of Norseman. You know, that's um, and there's evidence around Cambauda, two, 280 metres above present-day surface of old marine sediments. So the history, you know, the landscape's gone through a long, long history. And then we've got dune fields as well. You know, and not only have you had continental drift and, and the movement of the, of, the, of the continent, you've also got the effect of different climate and changing climate over time. All that's whether you've got warm, humid conditions forming deep weathering or whether you're destructing those profiles and stripping off that material and spreading around the metals. 
and um, that manifests itself in, in the landscape, so that when we look at this one here near uh, Kundana, within the landscape you've got, today you've got a Mediterranean type vegetation, semi-arid, but that's over the top of old former deeply weathered terrains with laterites and pisolists, etc. I just point out what a lot of variation you've got there in a short distance and um, a lot of regolith materials that could be collected, could, could be sampled. You've got everything from bleached inferred leach saprolite in the foreground to iron rich gravels in the background where you've got enrichment possibly occurring and then if you go out in the woods behind you've got sand dunes over the top of pisolis. So if you're doing a soil survey you'd be collecting any one of those that's where it's really important to log and record what the guys have put in the bags. You can predict that you're going to get low assays in one area, elevated assays in another, which doesn't have to be an anomaly, through to not working somewhere else. There's a lot of variation as you go across the terrain. And the next one then, just about some of the mechanisms in terms of elements moving, regolith effects in terms of calcrete. Again, Mel was intimately involved with this one, and... Um, Charles Butt and others in terms of distinct regolith effects, so from surface down below um, and just how the gold and the calcrete are co-precipitating. Well, the calcrete was there first and the, and the gold then co-precipitated onto the calcrete. And um, dispersion is our friend. Um, so tend to use this diagram quite a bit. In terms of the response doesn't have to be on surface. By using an auger rig, you can get down beneath and you try and pick up the geochem dispersion at depth. Um, just be careful that ferruginous materials, I think a great disservice has been done in the regolith. For a long time, it was always talk, talked about lateritic residuum. This photo here in the foreground I took in Mali on top of that hill in the distance. It's the highest part in the terrain and yet it's grossly transported. It's because you've got to, th and to explain that, think in 4D. There used to be a surface above that before, and the landscape's eroded. You stripped off an old profile and you dumped it off somewhere else. Each time the chemistry is moving around. Talk about changes in the terrain as you come across. You come across the landscape. If you collected a soil sample in the foreground, you're on top of the rock, elements tightly held. Um, you'd be able to find a deposit there. Next one, you're adding to alluvium. That furthest plateau there, when I walked on that one, um, just south of the Sahara, one side's residual, that's what I call laterite. The other one there is grossly transported, it's an old riverbed. That's the ferrocrete. If I came and collected lag samples around the base of that, one would tell me I'm close to source, the other one could have gold in it, but the source could be kilometres away, tens of kilometres away. So you've got to look and think in, look in 3D, think in 4D. And then you've got Aeolian impacts, and I've been out in dust storms like this, very spectacular. Uh, lightning usually comes in front of them, but um, this is now in West Africa, but West Australian terrain's probably gone through the same in the past, and therefore you've got a lot of dilution out there. So all of these should be taken into factor when you're thinking about what to do, but what are you going to collect? Um, it's very rare that it would be one, one technique, one media. Um, it's a matter of trying to work out how you're going to do it, what sample spacing, what density, what, what depth, what are you going to analyse for, that's going to be covered later. How do you interpret the result? What's anomalous? What are null values? What are negative values? What do you do next? And all of that apply the regolith concepts. So firstly, you need to assess the methods which are fit for purpose. And it's about what's the purpose of the survey? Is it recon? Are you doing following up? Is it a large project, small project? Um, are you doing it for political reasons? Um, you know, end of year budgets, etc. cetera. Uh, and then there's a whole range of geochemical tools, techniques available, everything from streams to waters, soils to rocks to groundwater, veg, termites, soil gases, you know, and there's others as well. Um, stream sets, I think, can be excellent first pass, but you need to have a decent incised topography. When you're putting out your samples, make sure that you, or planning them, make sure you step back off the floodplain of the other one if it's a, if it's a secondary river coming through step back a reasonable distance from it so you're not collecting the... Don't just go use a topo map and you go one river, one river, and you go into the confluence of both or close to them. Make sure you're back off, off the uh, floodplain um, for the tributary coming through. You need active erosion um, and uh, preferably dissecting the bedrock. And then you need r low, low detection limits and very high quality labs.
results. When it's done right, it can work fantastically well. Um, unfortunately, there's not the time to go into it. Uh, Newmont probably has one of the best techniques in the world for doing it. This was a survey I planned in Congo um, when I was working for them. And what it allowed very quickly is it, um, it, was, it focused in. So it's nearly 4,500 square kilometers. By do, in three months, we were able to screen through that and work out exactly where it was worth focusing and where ground could be dropped away. Um, soil sampling, well, each, each sample assesses the prospectivity of a much smaller area, say, than the stream said. But just how big an area depends on the dispersion mechanism. Depends on how deep you go. Um, and um, if you're down into, if you've got saprolite on the surface, essentially it's like a rock chip sample. Uh, you need to consider many, many, many factors, including fractions. Um, lag sampling is another one that could be done, which essentially is a coarse soil. Uh, it's been used effectively for finding deposits. Um, and it's about doing a minus something plus something. Uh, it tends to be a good way to filter out windblown sands. So collecting something like this, um, ferruginous lags, um, putting, say, a kilo of material in the bag. Um, it's been used a lot here in, in Australia, uh, CSRO in the late 80s in particular, um, with orientation surveys. Um, and because it's really exploiting the dispersion factor, you can do a relatively low density survey. One, one, for three, one sample for every three Ks to pull you into areas. Um, here's an example where it's been used up in uh, northern Burkina Faso. Literally the guys are sweeping the surface and then you put it, you sieve it through, all the windblown sands drop out. And, um, and then from that then you've come through and you've highlighted zones of interest and it's worked quite well. The strips that you can see across the imagery there, those are sand dunes. So that's what they're trying to filter out, and it works, works well for pulling you in. For soil samples, you tend to apply it on a regular grid. Um, commonly, it would be hundreds of metres apart, uh, tens, of, tens of metres of long lines. Um, and I would argue that you want some lateral uh, contamination. I want to be able to know not what only beneath, but I want to know what's adjacent. So I tend to just go shallow, and I tend to take a slice down the front. It's also because within the soil profile, you get zones of enrichment and zones of depletion. You don't know where those occur, so just take a slice, and therefore then you get some of the lateral movement and some of the point specific. Common mistakes I see is people thinking it's better to dig a deep soil sample, and they think that's a better thing because it's more work. It's not, because the deeper you go, the more point specific you get, or in some environments where you get stone lines, the stone lines can be narrow, high-grade quartz veins that over time, as, a, as the rocks are weathered, those have fallen down, they then sink down into the profile. If you then collect a deep soil sample, you then jag into that stone line intermittently, you'll then spike your soil results. It's not what you're there for. You're look, looking there to find a big deposit, not to get high, high flashy values, unless you want to ramp the share price. Um, consider different size fractions at different phases. I'll go for coarse fraction on the recon phase and then go finer later on and uh, Ryan's talk hopefully will talk more about that one. You could do trenching, it can be expensive though, you've got some safety issues, um, but it can be useful like Rangold's Mar Marilla example. Impractical ever, everywhere, you have to think about the regular terrain. If you're up in the pedalith with a deep profile, it's not always easy to get through into it. I like augering, um, it's a bit of a Lots of companies now in West Africa are auguring everywhere, which I think is a waste of time and money. Fit for purpose, there'll be places where soils will work better than augers. There's places where augers do more harm than good. There's a case where I've seen it down in Suriname where they'd augered and the results were all low, went back and soil sampled over the top. It was up in the hundreds of PPBs. The trouble was that the auger holes, one was land, landing in the foot wall, the other in the hanging wall. And just like going down a drill hole, you'll go from PPB to PPM and back to PPB. The auger's done the same. It's been sampling saprolite, you're in PPB. And not the PPM, whereas the soil is that better amalgamator and gives you a better dispersion. And, uh, but it does have the advantage sometimes of being able to declutter a big broad anomaly and pull you into where the roots are. Um, groundwater can be done. It's, 
there's a few complexities, which I don't think I've got time to go through. There's been big surveys done here in, in um, uh, under CSIRO and producing maps out in the eastern gold fields like this one, which pulls out the main provinces. It definitely has applications. I'm aware of companies now applying this in Africa for looking for deposits. It's, it, it's certainly got its application. The trouble is you don't know exactly where that anomaly's come from, so then you've got to search it in. But if you want to find a way to pull you into the district, it can be good. Um, vegetation sampling has been done by a number of companies, initially a lot out of Canada. And one of the ways was going around just chopping the tops off spruce trees, hanging out the chopper and grabbing those. Um, looks, looks like a fun job. Uh, however, there's plenty of problems in terms of what, what you sample. A lot of work done by C CSIRO as well. I think this one, this is over Moolart Well. Um, one of the ones I'd point out here is that you've, the assay results are all very low, but also within the one tree you've got quite a lot of variation. You've got from 9 ppb to 0.1 of a ppb, almost next door to each other. So if you've only collected one sample, one you'd follow up on and the other one you wouldn't. So maybe is the soil underneath better? Is that the better amalgamator? And then that depends on how stable that surface is and how much it's been washed. The signal may get there, but has it been washed away? Has it been obliterated? Termite sampling can be done and is done by companies. I'd say, though, that quite often those wash down. Um, uh, you can end up with soil in the... Uh, the, the soil surrounding the mounds are often the same as the termite mounds themselves. And I really only use uh, sample plateaus when I'm out on bare lateritic plateaus where those tend to be like little auger rigs and helping to pull the signal to the surface. And then within the termite mounds, this is where one's been cut in half, uh, lower down one there showing the gold grade, is you'll get a lot of variation in the gold grade within the mound. So you collect those as a composite sample to try and even out the variations. And the variation comes from which depth was it collecting. They go down to the water table. Well, where, where was the material coming from? And um, I'll just bring this one up quickly just to show you that, or to think about as you go across the landscape, the red lines there are supposed to represent uh, deposits. And there will be parts of the terrain where you can expect a strong response, essentially it's close to breakaways. Once you get out into cover areas, you put a cover su suite over there, you'll then be looking for a much lower level anomaly. Um, always important to log, have a systematic structure. People don't always log your increasing luck factor. Um, here's some real data where it's been plotted out as logs. From the log data, red circles show where everything fits the terrain and then there'll be one zone in red where it's recorded as residual and it's actually gone across a drainage channel and you go, ah, now is it because they can't log or did they is, is there some other issue, coordinates or something like that? Or did the sample crew actually go there? Um, when I collect stream sediments, I always have the, the crews on GPS tracking all day. Every 20 seconds they record. I want to see what they've sampled and where they've gone. That's part of my QAQC. So do that one. I just very quickly want to show you two quick examples from Burkina Faso where it's applied. <laughs> you're dealing with ferrocretes, plateaus. You're dealing with outcropping zones. I've looked at everything in 3D, normally have nerdy 3D glasses on. Essentially, you're dealing with plateaus. We're dealing with lateritic plateaus. We're dealing with strip profiles. Um, when we came onto the project, this is when I worked for Griffin Minerals running the exploration, the soil sample data set on the left was the one we inherited. Quickly, within a short space of time, the, the, the one on the right, we changed. I recognized a lot of data in there that was garbage. Um, what we did was did some stream sediment sampling. Um, to screen the whole area. Got two anomalies like that. I'm almost out of time, that's why I'm racing. Ended up doing some infill soil, stripped out old data. First drill program ended up with 34 at 6. So ignored the reg regional data, came back through. There's also mineralization under the plateaus highlighted. This one here is one that I did back in January this year. Regular terrain assessment, placed soil lines, it's a new company, pre-IPO, seed money, Boromo Gold. Um, quick regular terrain assessment, 800 by 80 metres seemed seem a good spacing. Did that. The results came back. We had two lines that came back anomalous. Did a quick infill and um, ended up going through and then auguring it. 
That work there was done for less than $10,000. Then we come through and augured it for another 15,000. We've now got a two kilometer long anomaly with up to six grams in saprolite and then laterite over the top. And that's the end of it. Thank you.